And I called my mom. Didn't know what to do. Who do you call? He called sure, you. Called sure, mom. Sure. Yeah. Called my mom, and I said, "Mom, I do not know what I'm going to be doing after college. What What should I do? Looking for any sort of guidance, mm-hmm. really." Mm-hmm. She asked me a question that changed my life forever. She said, Tyler, what do you love? And I immediately, without hesitating, and everyone should think of this, what is it that you really love? I said, hiking. Sure. Bless my mom's heart. She said, do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for clicking on this interview I did with Tyler Sokash, the living Lorax. In a nutshell, this guy hiked 7,000 miles in an 11-month time period. This was a particularly long interview, so I split it up into three separate parts on YouTube. And this is part one of three. I hope you enjoy it. Joining me is the living Lorax, Tyler Sokash, 30 years old, originally from Old Forge, New York. And so the reason, the way I know Tyler is he is the brother of my brother's best friend. And that's how we connected. And when I heard about his story, it's something that I knew, even though it didn't really go completely in line with my uh, Health Rebel series on YouTube, I knew it was something that I needed to get out there. So Tyler, welcome. Thanks, Ian. Um, so first of all, give us I don't know too, too much about this. I read a few articles. Give us kind of a big picture of what happened. What did you do that was so extraordinary? Sure. So what what happened was I made a drastic decision to buck the mold and to pursue what I love, what happens to be hiking. And I decided to leave normalcy behind. I quit my job finished my education, got on a plane to Seattle, and started a 7,000-mile through-hiking journey across three long-distance trails, the 2,650-mile Pacific Crest Trail, which goes from the U.S.-Canadian border through the three western states, Washington, Oregon, California, all the way down to Campo, California at the Mexican border. Cool. The second stage of the journey, I flew to Auckland, New Zealand, uh, caught a bus ride to Kataya in the North Island, and then hitchhiked to Cape Ringa, the very tip of the Northern Island of New Zealand, and walked 2,000 miles, or just over 3,000 kilometers, across both the North and South Island of New Zealand uh, on the Te Araroa, the long pathway in the Modi indigenous language of New Zealand. Uh, It's called the Long Pathway. And then I flew back to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, started at Springer Mountain, and walked home up the Appalachian Trail, finishing on Katahdin. So I'm one of the first people in the world to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, Tararoa, and the Appalachian Trail in just about a year. Cool. Really cool. So tell us about your your background living in Old Ford. You've always been into hiking. What what got you into hiking? Was it your family? Was it friends? So you're predisposed to outdoor recreation when you grow up in the largest state park in the lower 48 states. Not many people realize this. The Adirondack Park here in New York State is the largest state park. It's 6.1 6.1 million acres. What does that mean? No one ever knows yeah. what 6.1 million acres is. You could fit Grand Canyon, Glacier National Park, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Yellowstone, mm. Yosemite. Mm. All of those national parks, famous national parks, if you were to combine them all together, yeah. they would easily fit inside of the Adirondack Park. You could fit the entire state of Massachusetts inside the Adirondack Park. Mm. You could fit the entire state of Vermont inside the Adirondack Park. And so I grew up in a place which is known as the largest contiguous deciduous forest, intact deciduous forest in a temperate climate in the world. Mm. The Adirondack Park is a massive place. Uh, and when you, when you grow up there, when you're a kid, 
on the weekends, you're riding your bike through town, you're ditching it at a trailhead, you're jumping into a lake, you're canoeing, you're kayaking. And I, that's my niece in the background. (laughs) That's okay. That's not a big deal. And my family would take me on weekly camping adventures on Alger Island in the Adirondacks and a one week long camping trip every summer. We've done it for 23 years. And those micro exposures into the back country or going outside for even half a day here, half a day there helped me develop a really strong passion for the outdoors. Mm, yeah. And I just haven't stopped pursuing that passion. Cool. Really cool. What tell, tell us about, I found it really interesting um, in the few articles that I did read where you said you brought up something about a car and moving and kind of taking the next step in your in your professional life like most 27, 28, 29 year olds do. Yeah. And you sort of said you were at a point where you could either move forward with that mm-hmm. or move in a completely different direction. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, I think this is... The, the crucible of the story is exactly in this one moment when I was living on Park Avenue in, in downtown Rochester. And I had the option of continuing my existence in normalcy, of going to my office job, which was comfortable. And I loved the colleagues there. Uh, basically, my first career. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, well, it's actually the winter of 2014, 12 feet of snowfall in Buffalo, that fateful November day, yeah. and I am carless. I do not own a vehicle, so I was taking public transportation or walking, biking if the weather's decent. I had to decide, do I get a car to continue my normal track into and through adulthood where you get the 2.3 kids, you get the white picket fence, you buy a dog. Sure. Later on, you buy a boat, and then you retire, and then you die. <laughs> and, I, and that is a track that most humans take. It's unremarkable, and we all succumb to it. Well, luckily, way back in college, and I went to the University of Rochester as an undergrad and a grad student, during my undergrad years, my my. My future was in front of me. Graduation was impending. I knew I knew I had to enter the real world. Yep. And the most incredible thing happened. I'm on the precipice of jumping into my future, but I didn't know where I was going to land. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking over the cliff thinking graduation is just a few months away. Where the heck am I going to go? Mm-hmm. And I had I had the luxury of calling someone in my life that that changed my track and I called my mom didn't know what to do who do you call you call sure, you call sure, mom sure yeah called my mom and I said mom I do not know what I'm going to be doing after college what what should I do looking for any sort of guidance mm-hmm, really mm-hmm. she asked me a question that changed my life forever she said Tyler what do you love and I immediately, without hesitating, and everyone should think of this, what is it that you really love? I said hiking. Sure. Bless my mom's heart. She said, do that. Yeah. Well, I became a hiking guide. I did that for a couple of years. Worked for the Adirondack Mountain Club. Had the time of my life. But I felt this, this prodding to have a real career. Mm-hmm. I returned to Rochester I have a great career in higher education, finish a master's degree in school counseling, and that's the moment when I had to ask myself at 28 years old, do I continue on this path that is very predictable and comfortable? It was normal. Mm -hmm. I lived in a great place with great people who I loved. Uh, I didn't have to make many sacrifices because everything was smooth sailing, Ian. Mm -hmm. Well, that fateful November day in 2014 when it snowed a ton, Mm -hmm. I had to walk to Penfield High School where I was interning as a school counselor. How far was that? Six miles. 
and I walked in the cold. It didn't snow as much in Rochester as it did in Buffalo during that huge snowstorm that was debilitating. They buried Ralph Wilson Stadium, if you recall. Uh, in Rochester, it was just really cold. I walked six miles, and I got to Penfield High School, and I knew I was at my wit's end, and I also knew this isn't sustainable. I need to be an adult and buy a car. Sure. Here I am, 28 years old, never owned a car. I just used a bicycle or public transportation or walked everywhere. And finally, I just said, you know what? I need to commit because I can't keep walking to Penfield High School. Yeah, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just yeah. inconvenient. Yeah, yeah, okay, not a so, bad thing. So so you wanted to buy a car. Yep. And um, how did that lead you to this hike? Yeah. Well, I was going to get a 2015 Subaru Crosstrek, brand new, Tangerine. And I knew it was $24,000 brand new, which was a hard sum to swallow. Mm-hmm. So I I simply called my uncle who lives in the area and said, Uncle Mike, can you help me out? I'm going to get this new car tomorrow. Can you bring me to the dealership? And he said, absolutely. I'll be right there tomorrow morning. The story is I froze. I was in my attic crawl space of a bedroom. I froze and I had this realization, almost an epiphany, wash over me suddenly where I just had the urge to ask, how much does it cost to hike the Pacific Crest Trail? I Googled it, Mm -hmm. four to eight months, depending on how many bologna sandwiches you're comfortable (laughs) eating. And I was comfortable eating a lot of them if that's what it meant to do this trip. But then I had the audacity to type in, does New Zealand have a long distance hiking trail? It does, it's called Te Aroa. It was finished in 2011. And then I went a little bit over the edge by then typing in how long does it take to hike the Appalachian Trail. Mm-hmm. I crunched the numbers, hit enter on the calculator, and fortuitously, the dollar amount spit back when I factored in flights, food, gear, uh, hotel stays, laundry. When I factored everything in and I hit enter, Fortuitously, the calculator says $24,000, the exact same cost as this brand new 2015 Subaru Crosstrek. I immediately called my Uncle Mike back and said, Uncle Mike, I can't go get that car tomorrow. I'm going to go pursue a dream. Cool. So that's how it started. Really neat. That's really, that's so ironic how it was the, the exact, the exact amount. It was the irony that I required yeah. to jostle me from my normal life. Mm-hmm. So... You called your uncle back. You said, hey, uh, I, I I don't need your help anymore. Thank you very much, but I'm going to go do this hike. So tell us, I mean, I guess start us from start us from stage one. I mean, uh, tell us about, again, stage one was the Pacific Crest Trail. Mm-hmm. Um, again, when when did you start that? How long did it take? What yep. were some notable uh, yeah. f- f- uh, notable um, stories from the Pacific Crest Trail? Yeah, there, well... Some people don't know that we have national scenic trails that are designated by Congress, and they're there for Americans to enjoy and for much of the world to enjoy. These trails are highly international. You meet people from all over. So a national scenic trail like the Pacific Crest Trail is something where you can expect to do a little bit of walking, a little bit of uh, time for contemplation. It's a footpath through wilderness. Mm. Pacific Crest Trail is 2,650 miles long, and it does run the length of the West Coast. It doesn't go near the coast. It's not the Pacific Coast Trail. It's the Pacific Crest Trail. It's in the mountains. Uh, And it it does go through 48 wilderness areas. It goes through seven national parks, multiple national forests, and some uh, uh, national monuments as well, like Devil's Post Pile comes to mind in the High Sierra. It is the most incredible thing you will ever see in the United States of America. When you start off in the North Cascades in Washington, you're surrounded by stratovolcanoes. Think of Mount Rainier. Think of Glacier Peak, Mount Adams, the second tallest mountain in Washington State, Mount St. Helens, with the entire top fourth of the mountain blown to smithereens. You're walking 
through a landscape that is incredibly rugged with peaks, jagged peaks, jutting into the sky. And you're typically contouring on a very level path through and around these magnificent mountains and into steep valleys and ravines and through glacial streams and seeing beautiful wildlife. There's a lot of megafauna in Washington state still, and by that I mean large animals, elk, bears, deer, lynx. Uh, You can really have a a wild experience on the Pacific Crest Trail. Mm. The trail only goes through four towns. So if you need to resupply, you typically need to hitchhike and get comfortable with that. Or have a mail drop to a nearby location where you can pick up food. Um, You don't need to mail drop, but it certainly makes it a bit more convenient in certain locations. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, it's it's a trail uh, straight out of a fairy tale. Cool. The thing that makes it really remarkable is you go through so many different biomes. You're in the Mojave Desert. You're in the upper Sonoran deserts. You're in alpine vegetation. You're going through elevations that range from Forester Pass above 13,000 feet. You can even do an eight-mile side trip to Mount Whitney at 14,505 feet if you want to, the highest mountain in the lower 48 states. But it gets down to about 180 feet, the Columbia River Gorge right near the Um, town of Cascade Locks between Washington and Oregon. So you're going from about 180 feet above sea level to over 13 to 14,000 feet above sea level. You see a little bit of everything, uh, and it's the the scenery is always changing. This might be a good time to kind of um, put us put us on the trail and give us an idea of what your day to day. We're going to go into more details into your stage two and stage three, but. What were, you know, your your day-to-day activities? What You got up at what time and you just hiked, 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 and what time did you go to bed? Did you have any yeah. kind of a rhythm, daily rhythm? Do you remember what life was like before your first job at 14 or 15 years old when you would get out of school and at summer break? It's freeing. It's it's so freeing. You're... you're you're never bound to any sort of schedule. Every day is like being on summer break at 14 years old. You can hop on your bike and go anywhere in town that day. Mm-hmm. On a through hike, it's the same thing. You're a kid again. And the schedule I stuck to was waking up when my body knew it was time to wake up, hiking as far as my body would allow me, or until I got to a viewpoint so spectacular that I would force myself to stop. Uh, Typically in the mornings, you're waking around sunrise. You're eating oatmeal, usually cold oatmeal because you don't have time or really the need to heat your food anymore. You're then breaking down your campsite, which for me was simply stuffing my sleeping bag in its sleeping bag sack rolling up my inflatable mattress, a Thermarest mattress, to insulate me from the cold ground, stuffing that into my backpack, hoisting it over my shoulders, and walking south. Um, I was a southbound hiker, which is atypical, actually, on the Pacific Crest Trail. Most people hike north. Um, If you haven't thought of through hiking before, it's difficult to imagine what it would be like to walk across the United States. It's not something that's tangible or easy to wrap your head around. And you really have to set a point A to point B route in Rochester and walk the Lehigh Valley Trail or across Letchworth or just across town to realize what it means under your own power to go from one point to an entirely different other place. The way I got accustomed to through hiking, sure, I have this whole background of living in the Adirondacks where I hiked and camped all the time. doesn't mean I through hiked ever. I never had until 2014 Mm. 
when my friend Seth Jones and I completed the Northville Placid Trail, which in the Adirondack Park is a 133-mile through hike that was built in 1922. It's been around nearly 100 years. The Northville Placid Trail is a great chance for someone to explore what it's like to be a through hiker. It takes about seven days if you walk 20 miles a day, and that might sound difficult, uh, but once you're out there and you have a full eight to 15 hours of sunlight, depending on the time of year you go, mm-hmm. you really can set your own schedule. Mm-hmm. And if I hadn't done the Northville Placid Trail, our own very own through hike in New York State, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have known what to expect. Once you do a small micro adventure, like a week on the Northville Placid Trail or the Cranberry 50 Loop in the Adirondack Park or walking on the Finger Lakes Trail or down the Genesee River, across Letchworth. Once you do that, you start to realize, oh, I should probably bring a headlamp. Oh, I should probably get in better physical shape before embarking on an arduous journey of greater magnitude. Oh, I should probably have lighter things in my backpack so my shoulders don't ache as much at the end of the day. Uh, the routine for me was established by doing these smaller through hikes as preparation hikes before this year-long adventure. Mm-hmm. I didn't use the Northville Placid Trail as a preparation hike. I was just doing it because I wanted to try something different. The Cranberry 50 was designed to be my preparation hike. That's when I realized, oh, I, I probably need a lighter tent and sleeping system. So I ended up buying a tarp instead of a full tent and had a bivy sack uh, to keep myself warm at night. So I didn't have to carry the stakes and the, the poles and the tent and the fly. I just needed one tarp. That's mm. it. Mm. And uh, the routine of when to wake up, how far to go, that's just listening to your body. But you, you don't know what you're capable of until you try something small first. What, what was um, on average... What would you say your your days were? Yeah, you mileage wise. You did ask how long it took to do the Pacific Crest Trail. It is two thousand six hundred and fifty miles. It took me one hundred and twenty two days, uh, because I left on June twenty sixth and finished on October twenty sixth. It was exactly four months time. I left on the twenty sixth of June, finished on the twenty sixth of October. One hundred and twenty two days. If you take, oh yeah, 2,650. If you take 2,650 miles and divide it by 122 days, you're going to get 21.72 miles a day. So some days a little more, some days a little less. Depends on how much time you wanted to spend swimming in the beautiful lakes or taking in the vistas mm-hmm. or recharging in town, mm-hmm. which is important. I only took two rest days. We call them zero days when you walk zero miles in a day I only had two zeros on the entire 2650 mile um, Pacific Crest Trail uh, so I really was almost every day moving about 21.72 miles why, why did you choose those rest days where they were like what reason yeah the first was in Cascade Locks I had just f- finished walking across Washington State 515 miles of walking I thought I deserved a little day off it, it, uh, it coincided with a spout of bad weather so I just said well if it's raining I might as well just sit out one day and just hang out in town get a hotel room or a motel room you know it was pretty interesting I got to stay with a trail angel someone who just out of the goodness of their hearts wants to help the through hiking community they're called trail angels mm-hmm. anyone can really be a trail angel anytime you pick up a hitchhiker and give them a ride to town or back to the trail or hand an apple or a Snickers bar out to a hitchhiker, or see if they need any water, uh, or let them stay at your house because you've realized that they're safe people and just need a hot shower and a nice bed for the night. Uh, there are trail angels across all these through hiking trails. Some people pride themselves on it, like this man in Cascade Locks named Shrek. He allows hordes of through hikers to stay on his property. He even built a little shrek's house just like out of the movie for hikers to stay in a little janky cabin it's really cool i love staying there and uh i did stay at a trail angels that night uh the next time was due to pure agony i had developed 
as disgusting as this is to say, a corn between my toes mm. from the constant pressure of my boot constricting my feet. Mm. And uh, I just needed to rest my feet and my legs. And I took that rest day at Mammoth Lakes, California, a popular ski resort town for everyone in LA looking for a little reprieve from the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was my second zero, which was perfect because I met one heck of a trail family while I was in town and we walked all the way to Mexico together. So talk to us about the tra- that epic trail family that you met. And also yeah. after that, I want to move into maybe you spoke about an, an injury. Um, me being in sports medicine, I'm kind of interested in mm-hmm. what your injuries were, what kind of uh, medical equipment you carried. But tell us about that family first. Sure. Well, a trail family is a group of people who you walk with during your through hike. And they're a fluid mosaic model. You know, there are people coming and going. You can stay as long as you want or as long as you're welcome to stay. Uh, I was lucky that I had three phenomenal trail families across the Pacific Crest Trail. It started off, everyone has a trail name, by the way. So you you get an alias, if you will, while you're through hiking, which is so great because it doesn't matter who you're from or what you were doing before the trails that matters is that you're there in the moment with these other intrepid souls who and decided yours was oh gosh future dad future dad yeah they called me future dad interesting yeah there's always a story behind it um, my first trail family was with wildfire and half jesus my two great friends who walked across washington state with me uh, i met half jesus and wildfire in the town of stahican washington coolest town in america it's at the end of lake chelan the third deepest lake in the country it's a 60 mile long lake Mm. the only way to get to stahican is to take a ferry charter a seaplane or walk the pacific crest trail so it's very remote uh and i met wildfire and half jesus there they were so wonderful to me you just you just click with these other individuals who are out on a crazy adventure like you are half jesus always used to say people are at a crossroads And that's typically why they do a through hike. They're at a point, a natural break, when they can put life on hold, say goodbye to friends and family. It takes a lot of sacrifice to go on a through hike and up and leave for a four to six month journey across the country. Uh, They were phenomenal. I still stay in touch with them. I then, in Cascade Locks, uh, at the beginning of Oregon, met Mantis, my good friend who walked across the state of Oregon with me in about 18 days. And then in Mammoth Lakes, California, I met the most incredible group of people, Bug, Huck, Harpo, Groucho, and Twinless. The six of us walked just about 800 miles together through the end of the High Sierra, ending on top of Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in the lower 48 states. And then we embarked on the 700-mile quest through the desert to the Mexican border together. Stories to last a lifetime with those people. But I had trail families on the other the other two trails as well. I'll talk about them later. But there were some injuries along the way. The ones that I remember most can have a bit of a story attached sure. to them. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. (laughs) I was in the Goat Rocks Wilderness in southern Washington. You've got to go there. It is stellar. There are mountain goats, elk roaming the mountains. I remember separating from Half Jesus and Wildfire for the night because I wanted to watch the sunrise behind Mount Rainier. A Crayola crayon canvas. We're talking beautiful shades of red, magenta, purple, yellow, orange. Unbelievable. Greatest sunset of my life. I had the idea that, well, that was great. Why don't I walk through the night without sleeping and catch the sunrise from Goat Rocks, one mountain range over. I hike through the night. I see elk galloping through the misty fields. Mount Rainier is disappearing into the distance as I hike further south. All of a sudden, I'm surrounded by Mount Adams, Goat Rocks, Mount St. Helens. And only two weeks earlier, I was flying into Seattle. And 
when I looked out of the plane window, I saw all of those volcanoes. It's incredible. We don't have topography like that on the East Coast, so it's hard to explain what it looks like to see 13 to 14,000 foot volcanoes rising out of the earth. I cried. I was in Goat Rocks Wilderness realizing that I was pursuing and achieving my hopes and dreams. Well, I then had the idea that instead of walking the Pacific Crest Trail, I would go off trail for the day, Ian. There's an alternate route, and there are many alternate routes on through hiking trails. This one went over Old Snowy, and it's over 9,000 feet, high alpine, talus fields, and there's a technical route from Old Snowy to Ives Peak, even taller, uh, that you can scramble your way along and make it, instead of staying in the valley for the day, you're up on a high ridge. Well, I got up there, took a look around, and said, this is dangerous. I took one step towards Ives Peak, started a rock slide, really freaked out, had to retreat back to the summit of Old Snowy, and just then, this beautiful girl comes up hiking in a sports bra, and she gives me this look of, are you um, turning around? I was, oh, no, 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 I'm not turning around. Especially then her dad comes up, and he's like, I used to hike to Ives Peak as a kid. Now the pressure's on. So I, I oh, yep, I'm, yep, I was just going to Ives Peak right now. So I cross the Rockfall area again. I make it to Ives Peak due to some serious peer pressure by those two. I was having a euphoric moment. It was so beautiful. I was hiking on glaciers, made it to the summit of this talus peak. I was having such a good time, Ian. I didn't realize that little rocks had found their way into the bottom of my boot. I didn't notice it until about three hours later when I bushwhacked back to the Pacific Crest Trail that I wasn't feeling good. I kicked off my boots to discover them bathed in blood. When you start a through hike, your feet aren't tough yet. They aren't right. calloused. Um, it would be like going on a century ride on your bike without ever doing a 10K ride first. Your legs would be destroyed. You can't run a marathon before you run a 5K. Well, I was trying to do a 2,650 mile through hike without ever doing that before. So of course you're going to encounter some physical problems. I rolled into a campsite because I couldn't put any more pressure on my feet. There was a campsite down the hill. I laid down and I rolled. There were two northbound hikers there who had made the arduous journey all the way from Mexico to that point. They were in the end of their quest. I was in the beginning. And they looked at me with such disdain. And you could tell they were saying, he's not going to make it to Mexico. And I believed him. I really did. Here's the story. One of them turns to me and says, hey, future dad, you know what you need? Luco tape. Physical trainers use Luco tape all the time. It's a very adhesive bandage that acts like duct tape, except it doesn't come off when it gets wet, when it's raining, when you cross a stream, when you sweat. It stays on. It can stay on for a week or so. I said, I don't have any Luco tape. And he goes, oh, well. Well, the other person at the campsite, another northbounder, turns to me and says, you know what you need, future dad? Luco tape. I don't have any. And he's like, Oh, well, the trail's going to challenge you physically, mentally, emotionally, sometimes all at once. It would probably help if you had Luco tape. Oh, thanks. I wish I had that. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Well, the next morning, they leave, and I'm terrified to look at my feet. So I stay in, in my sleeping bag, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m. I finally, finally think about leaving when I hear someone whistling. Another northbound hiker comes around the corner whistling. And I had heard of this man before. He was a trail legend that year. His trail name's Bipolar. Everyone has a funny trail name. I said, hey, are you Bipolar? And he goes, who, me? I don't know. Maybe. I was like, that's you. That's Bipolar. He comes down and graciously gives me an hour of his time just shooting the breeze. Finally, at the end of our hour-long conversation, he goes, future dad, what's up? You look down in the dumps. I said, Bipolar, it's my feet. I climbed to Ives Peak yesterday, got some rocks in my shoes, and I don't think I'm going to make it to Mexico. And he goes, you know what you need, future dad? Luco tape. And I said, I don't have any. And he goes, 
You can have all of mine. And that was the first moment of my transformation. You know, sometimes people have this expectation that you're going to change drastically out there. Well, through this first injury, I started to change because I was a recipient of a random act of kindness that I didn't deserve. Bipolar became my first trail angel. And I was flabbergasted at his act of kindness. To be given something when you have so little, to give up something when you have so little, I think is incredible. And it's always the people that have less seem to be the happiest. The least seem to be the happiest and seem to be the nicest. I couldn't believe that this man just gave me part, the most critical component of his medical kit to a stranger. Well, that was the first injury that I had that really changed me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else as you, I mean, the usual blisters here and there, any kind of tendonitis um, in, in all three the, of your stages? Yeah. What I did have with the boots... It wasn't the boot's fault. The, what I what I had was constant pressure on my toes, and that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I did develop a corn, which I felt like a six year old woman in high heels. Mm-hmm. Uh, I couldn't believe how painful a corn could be between my toes. This this growth, tender growth on the side of my pinky toe that just made it so painful to walk. Uh, there was that. There was a little bit of a bone bruise that happened after I fell. But to be honest, I'm one of the luckiest guys out there. I've, I saw people hiking in casts, casts because they didn't want to end their through hike, and they mm. were told to stay off of it for a month or two, and they had to finish the trail. This was the only time in their life when they'd get to hike the so Pacific wait, Crest Trail. So upper body or lower body casts? Someone had a boot on. Really? Yeah, a full boot, um, and it was hiking in a boot. I mm. couldn't believe it. Mm. Yeah. So besides Luco tape, what else are must-haves on the trail if you're thinking of through hiking for anything longer than you know a month? Yeah, the answer is ibuprofen, yeah. vitamin I, as the hikers call it. Uh, of course, you anything can happen. Sure, anything can happen anywhere. I, I think it's funny. People always said, "Aren't you afraid of the bears, Tyler?" Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. because there are thirty-five thousand motor vehicle deaths per year. And only about 90 bear deaths in the last 120 years Mm -hmm. in the United States. So you're 35,000 times more likely to get hurt driving around the United States than you are to just be hiking a through hike. So you you can't prepare for everything. You know, there's danger everywhere. Um, But I carried leukotape, ibuprofen, et cetera, and migraine because sometimes you get so dehydrated out there that a headache will start. And so you got to mitigate that. Those are the main things that I would carry Mm. every time. Those are the three things. Um, Sure, would it be nice to have a splint just in case and a GPS just in case and all the bandages and mole skin in the world? Yes. Um, But you you start to learn that you can only carry so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't bring everything in the kitchen sink out there. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say leukotape, ibuprofen, Saturn migraine, those are the three things I'll always carry. Great.